Welcome to the Investors Podcast. I'm your host, Dick Broderson, and today we lined up the A-team for you, ladies and gents. Um, I'm here with Toby Carlisle, Jack Taylor, and Wes Gray. Uh, welcome back on the show. Hey, Stig, what's up? <laughs> Good to be here. Yeah, we hardly see each other these days. <laughs> <laughs> Honored so, to be here, as always. Great. Great guys, it's it's always good to uh, to have you here on the show. And you know, we we talked about the outline, and I wanted to I wanted to start out with a very want to timely question. Uh, ESG seems to be all the rage in the investment world right now. And if someone's sitting out there and like, yeah, I know I live on the rock. What is ESG? Is there any rage at all? Um, so that stands for environmental, social, and governance. And so. Over the years, uh, we've gotten multiple requests about you know defining what is ethical to invest in or not, and it's such a tricky question because it quickly turns into you know political heated debate, uh, which is not where I want to go with with the question at all. Um, I guess there's already enough polarization going on, so perhaps we shouldn't go that route. Um, but you know, Warren Buffett, uh, a billionaire, we started a lot. You know, he's been asked multiple times about this. If if you go back and watch the the annual shareholders meetings, and you know, he talks about how this is individual choice, and he mentions the example of you know him and Charlie. They had the opportunity to invest in tobacco company, uh, which which were a really good business deal, but they decided to walk away from it uh, because the deemed it wasn't it wasn't the right thing to do. But then, on the other hand, Buffett also acknowledged that you know he doesn't mind investing in Walmart, and you know you can go to Walmart to buy cigarettes. So uh, with all of that being said, I wanted to throw it back over to the group. And I don't know if we can start with you, Jake. Uh, how do you think about ESG, if at all, whenever you invest? Uh, it's it's not a large component, I guess, of my process. But what I would like to say is that I the, the good companies... So like, what makes a good company? Like, You want a long, sustainable business that will last a really long time. And as an investor, that's also what I'm looking for. I want a really long duration business that I can know and understand and own and earn similar to the results of the business. Well, the really good businesses, the good operators, the good management, they've been thinking about all the stakeholders for a long time. So there's nothing really new about ESG. Um, you know, Japan has this thing they call the five joys in business. And those were the suppliers, the employees, the regulators, the envir- or the, the uh, communities that the businesses uh, operate in, uh, and then the shareholders. And so everyone is part of this ecosystem and the, and the good management, we're, we're already managing to create win-win outcomes for everyone in the ecosystem. And so there's really nothing that new to me about ESG. It's just kind of a, a fancy name. And Honestly, I, I think a little bit of a, a marketing uh, ploy in that if there's this saying that like if if ducks are quacking, then then Wall Street will feed the ducks, right? And so if everyone's asking for ESG, then like okay, here you go, we're gonna put this, we're gonna call this ESG, and you're gonna get it. Uh, so I I don't find it. I kind of feel like it's a, a much ado about nothing. And then we can charge another thirty basis points if we call it ESG, <laughs> perhaps. Sure. Um, Wes, I want to throw that question over to you. Uh, do you think at all about ESG? Um, how do you think about ethics? In no, uh, well, so I, I have a two-sided brain, but I'll explain that. So on personal investments, on things that we create to you know generate returns and what we invest our own money in, you know, you never should tie emotions to investing, in my opinion. So for our own stuff, we don't involve it. We buy cheap, high quality, or we buy winners, period. It's evergreen. Now on the business side, because remember we launch ETFs on behalf of other people. I'll tell you with certainty, this is a huge deal, massive market, going to have probably huge effects on asset pricing. Um, And there's like investing, unfortunately, is going to get political if it hasn't been already. And I foresee very near term future where people actually identify with their portfolios politically and they'll expose that show that I think we're going to see a whole new world of emotional involvement inside of portfolios, which I think is awesome as a factor investor (laughs) who's a, you know, old school, like let's just try to make money guy. But um, 
it's going to be interesting, I think, over the next three to five years here. And Toby, uh, if I throw it over to you, because uh, I know like with the way deep and sick uh, the tickers uh, for your ETF are constructed, you know, there are different rules that have to follow to be a part of the of the portfolio. Um, do you have any kind of ESG filter in? Is it something you considered? Uh, how do you think about this? Uh, that they're not ESG funds. Uh, they're not explicitly set up to be ESG funds. They they do score okay, according to Morningstar, along some of those lines, but that just might be the investment style sort of manifesting as lowish sort of carbon, that sort of stuff. I think um, it's usually a bad idea to mix your personal biases in with your investing. If If your objective is returns, if your objective is something else to express your political opinions, then, you know, by all means, find the fund that achieves that end. I, I think that the research is the research is a little bit mixed, but the the pitch for ESG is that it lowers the cost of capital, and therefore uh, you can starve the worse industries and you you feed the better industries, and that should lead to um, more money flowing to to better things. The problem is that you know we poll ten people and we'll get five people diametrically opposed to the other five people about what good ends are. Uh, you know, there's a there's a MAGA ETF out there that you can buy and there are probably political ones on the other side of the spectrum that you can buy and they both think that they're doing the moral thing by investing in those. Um, the, the the mixed research seems to be that, you know, when you when you increase the cost of capital for something, you get better returns out of it. So that's still going to attract people who want those vice type investments to, to go into those. So the the um, the pitch would be that you reduce the cost of capital for things that are score high on whatever ESG components that you you seek, and therefore they do better because they have a lower cost of capital while they're operating their business. But then, on the other hand, when you increase the cost of capital for something, you 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 lead it to have better forward returns. So it's that's that's why the vice portfolios will continue to exist. I think that it probably all cancels itself out. I agree with Wes that there's enormous interest in it. And as a marketing tool, if I just wanted to be 100% marketer, I'd just start rolling out portfolios that appeal to particular political groups and uh, you know charge more for them. But uh, that's not what I do. So... Uh, I, I don't. I watch it, but I, I'm not. I'm not involved in it at all. So perhaps let's talk about uh, how it influences uh, financial markets. And I also think it's important to to say that there's no such thing as a universal, you know, accepted standard for what is ESG. It's just like you know, the, the four of us might have some kind of idea of what value investing is, or at least what it has been historically. But there's no like a, a strict rule book saying you can only invest in stocks with a PE lower than 15 or or whatever that is. And it's sort of like the same thing with ESG. It's a it's a term that's been sort of like back a few years, uh, you know, when everything was AI, whether it was AI or not, it was just AI because you know it sounded good. Um, but regardless how we define it, it is something that's you know you you look at different sources. Uh, I just looked one up here uh, from from uh, Bloomberg who said like in 2025, a third of the assets would be uh, in ESG funds in the States. So it's, it's something we need to we need to consider one way or the other. Um, so I, I guess uh, my question to you is, uh, which impact does the rise of ESG have on the financial markets? And does it change the way you invest? And I'm not so much talking like ethical reasons, but are you more thinking, oh, but this is what the herd is doing, or this is where the market are do doing. So I need to position myself accordingly. Is there such a thing as that? And and Wes, I, I can't help but throw it over to you. You're you're not just looking at fundamentals yeah. and your funds. You're looking at other things as well. So so I think there is a massive opportunity for the following trade in ESG. Don't buy things that already look ESG and pretty because they already have that low cost of capital and the gains are gone. And your go forward basis, as as Toby highlighted, is going to be lower expected returns. But if you wanted to try to have your cake and eat it too, you would go after the ugliest, nastiest ESG firms you could possibly find and then go active on them in an ESG sense, right? Try to turn Monsanto into whatever, like 
I don't know what the top ESG firm is, but some, you know, some firm that's really clean. Patagonia or something. Yeah, Patagonia. Yeah, try to turn Monsanto into Patagonia because you would take the cost of capital from, say, 15% to, like, zero effectively, and you'd get a massive, like, quadrupling or 10x in valuation. And so I think you're going to see, and we're talking to a few people that actually, like, operators looking at this. I know there's already some in hedge fund space, but that's a huge arbitrage opportunity is for people that can kind of take ugly and make it pretty and then make the spread in the beauty contest. I think that's going to be a big theme. And a lot of people are going to get rich and earn tons of quote unquote alpha over the next five, 10 years doing that. Let me ask you guys this question. Are, are we one bear market away from not ever hearing about ESG again? Yeah, I was going to say it's, it's a little bit more of a bull market special than it is something that people are going to be concerned about if we've had a very, very long bull market and people, everything looks easy at the top. So you just add a few more layers of complexity in to get yourself where you want to be. Yeah, As a I, fact. I mean, I, I actually somewhat disagree a little bit on that. There, there's an element of that, like the sentiment component, because people have the luxury to invest more emotionally. But also, I do think there's a real component of true lower cost of capital and obviously going into a shit storm, all else equal, you know, if you have a lower cost of capital, you can take on MPV projects with, you know, easier, you can keep your boat going where, you know, if you believe that cost of capital spikes during a, a bomb out, well, if you already had high cost of capital, now you just can't get any projects funded. And so I do feel like there, there's some sort of weird like margin of safety in some sense, because I believe that the, the lower cost of capital is a real economic phenomenon in the marketplace right now. I believe that, that is real. I think Jake was just saying that is the interest in it at a peak because oh, yeah. we've made yeah. so much money for such a long time. And if you if you go back to the bottom to people like ESG is probably the first thing that goes overboard. Yeah, when well, it's people outperformed other stuff. as well. It's had like this great relative performance streak in general, which we all know is fleeting and won't exist in the future. So you're right. You're you're going to get a shakeout on the on the performance chasers, but I do believe there's true believers out there too. Can we well, unpack the that cost of capital a little bit more? I'm curious about. So when I think about the mechanics of a of actually like a company getting dollars in the door to deploy into new equipment and employees and all these things, the the stock market's a secondary market. The money is not going. When I go buy a share of Apple, it's not like. Tim Cook gets that dollar, right? Like I'm just trading places with someone that already owns that share. So how is it lo actually lowering the cost of capital for uh, for well, these businesses? So, yes. So when you like, um, you, if you basically do like M&A activity or, you know, you go raise capital from the street, you need to fund different projects. Okay. So follow-ons and... Yeah. Well, it's also, remember, inside of Apple... Yeah, remember inside of Apple, they run their own capital allocation. They have like a hundred billion dollars. And so to the extent that you can fund higher MPV projects that are above your cost of capital, you're going to add a creative value to the shareholders eventually. Whereas if I'm in a, you know, I don't know, I'm Monsanto, right? If I've got a billion dollars, my project, if cost of capital is a lot higher. And so the bogey to try to beat that is really hard. And if I just can't find any projects to invest in, in real money terms, I can't add real economic value to my share price. And assuming the stock market's somewhat efficient, like it, it should be able to account for that. Um, especially if there's, you know, if we're in like a bad regime where, where some people just can't now fund projects, how are you going to add any economic value um, is the argument. So, so you're right, but, but there is internal real decision-making presumably going on at these firms, I would say. There's two there's two issues though, right? There's to what extent can head office get itself into an ESG type framework? And I think most firms have probably gone through that exercise and ticked almost every single box that they can't they can. And if they haven't, then maybe there's some avenue for activism there. But there's probably not much at very big firms. The problem is going to be for the companies that have their core business is something that ESG doesn't like. And so, for example, like the oil drillers, that there's just no way other than getting out of that business that you can improve your ESG score, your environmental score there. So I don't know, we sort of, we're, we're, we're voting 
with our dollars to um, to starve those industries of capital, but we're still consuming it on the other end. So I just see them sort of um, doing very well. Uh, shareholders in those businesses doing very well. You mean in the in the dirt ball businesses? There's some that are just you know I just yeah. give Exxon or Chevron or one of those as an example. Like yeah, head office can get themselves a green logo and go and click or, you know, go and tick all of the boxes. But the, the underlying business is the issue. And there are lots of businesses like that. Like you can come up with a pretty annual report and a nice green logo and you can run all of the ads that you want, but you're ultimately not solving the problem that people are upset about. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. We, we've seen a lot of activism in those, those companies here recently. And you know, I, I don't know if it's a, if that's a long-term player or a short-term play. Like you come in and they, typically the, the activists own very, very little, but because it's ESG, they can get so much more publicity out of it. And I, I can't help but wonder, I'm not saying it's a good, good cause, but I can't help but like, it is a part of the play that they will be so annoyed by the activists, they will just buy them out. Because I don't know if it was Royal Dodge, but it was like 0.5% or something. Like it's very, very small amounts that they have and they claim you know want to have bought bought seats and they don't have enough votes for that but it's esg so it's it's really interesting to see what's what's going on yeah they're not they're not uh they're not they're not trying to make money in their in that activism they're trying to achieve a political end through shareholder activism yeah the the, the one thing that's also interesting that i i've been thinking a lot more about is existential threat because on one hand i'm a huge believer okay let's go buy monsanto exxon all the dirt balls because to toby's point you know you can't put too much lipstick on the pig it's still a freaking pig but hey if the pig's fat and i can buy it cheap and i can clip that coupon that free cash flow it could be a great investment however i could foresee pretty near in the future here because government has gotten so involved in business unfortunately you can have a situation where they're just, even though it may not be rational from a societal perspective, they're just like, nope, we're cutting it off. Or nope, we're going to tax it a million percent, i.e. just turn the business off. Um, so there is kind of this risk premium. You also need to put in those things. And I don't know how well it's priced into like an Exxon where it looks great on the dividend yield. But what if that there's a chance that's not zero, that it goes to zero, Right. And so I just don't know. I haven't thought about it too much, but you know that could be a real value play that is actually a value trap. That's <clears> so that's what I was think about it. alluding to a little bit at the start by yeah. saying there's a tension between, um, you know, the cost of capital and and those existential threats, exactly like that the the ones that you're discussing, and on the other hand, the lower lower cost of capital, higher cost of capital, having knock on effects on the returns. I think. The, uh, you know, oil and gas are probably a little bit safer from those things because we actually still do need them, consume them, you know, basically everything that we make almost immediately. Uh, the bigger risk probably tobacco, and that's probably why tobacco, they could just decide that societally there's no benefit there. For consumers, probably for the farmers, there's a benefit, but for the consumers, there's none. So they'd, they could just switch that off. Yeah, or I guess they could repurpose their skill sets and like capital raising distribution cannabis. marketing yeah there's always that would be the real value salt play. tobacco with cannabis yeah yeah you, you'd almost want to buy the news when like the president whoever's in says you know what we're outlawing smoking or we're outlawing oil gas that's probably one you'd want to buy because it'd be good old-fashioned ben graham style and then right. you know they could probably repurpose those skill sets and knowledge over 100 years to something um but it might be too risky right now. I don't know. Yeah. Who said that this conversation would ever turn political, huh? Uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we have yet, have we? No. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> you never know how people react. No, no. It's, it, yeah, it's, this is not political, but I think the reality, it, all investors need to be cognizant that politics seem to have a lot more influence in investments so you, so you want to be aware of, of the landscape out there regardless of what your own personal beliefs are obviously let's I'm go sure. brandon <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. all right so um going to the next question here in the outline for today 
Uh, I want to talk a bit more about um, international investing. You know, we have um, U.S. equities valuation at you know all-time highs, and Toby has been on the show like very recurrently for like six, seven years. Every time he comes on, he says something along the lines of "nothing new." It's crazy. <laughs> it's a it's a bull market. <laughs> we like what is going on, and here we are in 2021. I can't I can't help but but give Toby a jab there. Uh, but you. The three of you have a lot of um, U.S. equities in your portfolio, whereas I also know you have international uh, portfolio. But um, I guess the, the, this is the case for many of our listeners. Uh, you know, we are exposed to a lot of U.S. equities, and we we do know as value investors that they look uh, at least historically relatively expensive. Um, what kind of data, if any, would you need to see over the next, say, decade? to convert to investing significantly sums outside the U.S. Um, Jake, why don't we throw it over to you? Why do I always have to go first? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my personal approach is much more to go wherever I find value. So we're already looking internationally and have been for a long time. Um, granted, I don't always feel like I understand cultural things as well as I probably do in the U.S. So there's... I, I, there has to be an even bigger delta on price for me to feel comfortable often, um, or even higher quality. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm finding a fair amount of things internationally to do that makes sense at the moment. Um, and especially probably relative to the U S. Um, so I don't know if I really need any new data per se. Um, but I would, um, just for fun, like we talked about different numbers. I, I was, went back and I reread in 2003, Warren Buffett came out with this article with Carol Loomis in, uh, I think it was in Fortune, where he's talking about the trade deficit. And he had this idea where if you could, we could balance the trade somewhat for the US by requiring these like voucher system, basically. Um, and it's always interesting to take his, what the numbers that he points to at that time period and like what he's concerned about and then roll forward the you know like what what have the numbers done since then and is it even more concerning um so if, if real quick i could give you some of those i looked them up uh recently so he's talking about how in the u.s world war ii to the early 1970s the u.s was a powerhouse we were a trade surplus everyone else in the world's their factories were all bombed out like we really set our reputation as a as a premier country at that time period and uh, net investment, which means like how much of other countries' assets do you own versus how much of foreigners own U.S. assets? We were positive 37 billion in 1950, and then positive 68 billion in 1970. So we owned more of the world's assets than they owned of ours. Late 1970s, trade reversed, and the deficit was running at one percent of GDP. But net investment was still moving up because we were getting returns on our investment of our foreign ownership. So by 1980, it peaked at 380 billion we owned of net of what the rest of the world owned of the U.S. Well, when Buffett wrote this article when, in 2003, when he was concerned, the trade deficit was running at 4% of GDP and net investment was $2.5 trillion to the negative. So foreigners owned claim checks like you know, bonds of the government and our corporations, they own real estate, they own equities. So two and a half trillion on a five or 50 ish trillion is what Buffett came up with of a total kind of net wealth of the US. Well, so that that equates to about 5% of national wealth. We, you know, if you pictured us as like a family, we sold 5% of the farm basically to over consume uh, effectively. Um, so today, when we I looked up some of these numbers, the net international investment position in the US is negative 14 trillion on a roughly call it 140 trillion of total wealth. And that number, I, my personal uh, bias is that that number is probably inflated by very low interest rates. Um, so, but anyway, that's 10% of net wealth now that basically the rest of the world owns of, of our productive capacity because we've wanted to consume so much. And the trade deficit in the last 12 months is has been $835 billion. Uh, and that's, if you call US GDP roughly 20 trillion, that's, a, that's actually a similar kind of 5% GDP uh, of the, the deficit is 5% of GDP. So 
all the numbers kind of basically doubled from when Buffett was concerned about them in 2003, uh, maybe even a little bit more. Um, so all of which is to say our sort of like premier catbird seat in the U S as being the best place. And, uh, you know, our, I, I would say our fiscal house is in less order than it was 20 years ago, even when Buffett was concerned about it, which just means that, uh, like any rich family, you know, the more that you've sold off the farm, like sort of the less that you probably have to look forward to as far as consumption. At some point, you can't just always be running deficits forever uh, and not have to balance it at some point. So um, perhaps who knows when, but that isn't a potential argument for wanting to maybe have more international exposure. Toby? Yeah, I'm the only one who really doesn't have much international exposure, which is funny because of the three <laughs> guests, I'm the, I'm the only one with an accent. Um, yeah, I just I run two domestic US equity funds because they were the two. Well, the first one was the easiest one to set up for me. And uh, I just invest in my own funds. So uh, it kind of makes it if I was to sit down with a financial planner and show them what I had done, they would say that it's a bad idea and that I should get more international exposure. And I 100% agree that everybody's got a home country bias. What are the chances that the US is the country that outperforms over the next, like, whatever useful, uh, like, whatever life I've got left, 40, 50 years, whatever it is. The rest of the world, you know, it's, it's, it's low-ish. There's just so much competition out there. So I should have more international exposure, but at some point, I think I'll, I'll have an international fund and then that would be how I would get that international exposure. Um, but it's not yet, but yeah, so I don't do it, but theoretically it's, it's, it's a good idea. Wes? Yeah. I mean, I, I think, uh, Toby kind of nailed it there. We, we usually show a chart of like the last hundred year history of, uh, us equities versus international equities like five-year rolling performance and it literally looks like a sine wave or like a yo-yo um and obviously we're on the far right side of that graph where the us has been winning for 10 years and the international has been bombing out but if history is any guide you know <laughs> valuations matter uh right now develops 20 us is 30 uh at the toby's point deep values under 10 pe international it's even cheaper so I'm a big fan of international diversification and like Toby, you know, we in our own cooking, um, our cooking just happens to already have international cooking. So it's a lot easier for us to do that. But if, yeah, if I didn't have a, uh, international cake baked up and I didn't trust anyone else that I'd probably be a U.S. only, uh, cake eater as well. So I get, I get where he's coming from, but I personally, globally invest in like deep value around the globe. I, I just, I will say this for the U S just to, just to make a counterpoint on the other side, the U S has been um, still remarkably successful, even over the last decade of producing these phenomenal consumer franchise businesses that really the rest of the world just hasn't done other than China. China sort of seemed to be able to produce comparably big, uh, comparably kind of great consumer franchise businesses. I just don't face any of them because I don't speak Chinese. I don't use any of them other than like, I've had a look at Alibaba's US website and it's kind of interesting, but I haven't bought anything on it. That's going to be the limitation. I think if you want to get some exposure, you've got to kind of get over the political issues in China, um, which are significant and uh, to get access to the business which to the businesses, which seem to be pretty good. Whereas when you look at the U S you know, you don't have any, well, maybe you don't have, you have increasing political issues, but, uh, not as many as in China and, and you can get access to these very good businesses. And that's why the index looks the way it does. Like the top four or five businesses in an index in the S and P 500 are pretty spectacular businesses that they're expensive, but they're not like, they're not they're not as bubbly as, uh, as we've seen at like a dot com bubble top. Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a really good point. And, you know, it always goes back to you know, what does it truly mean to be diversified and do you want to invest in something you don't truly understand? And I think at least for the four of us, we, we are most comfortable with the U S market and, you know, we, 
if you look at the, the what total mile cap compared to the rest of the world, it's like at 50 odd something. Then you could, all, of course, also look at the GDP of the US, which is probably close to 22 or something like that. So it's also like, what is your what is your benchmark? Um, it's a, uh, it you know it it it's hard, and and I guess that's a that's a segue to 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 the next question here because I wanted to talk about different investment strategies, and I'm going to mess up this this quote so so Wes can set me straight here, but you know. During this, uh, these uh, calls, Wes have said multiple times something along the lines of "be religious and be religious about having many religions." <laughs> and uh, you know, as as value investors, we taught early that value inve investing works because it doesn't work all the time. Like, um, you know, I, I I could give Toby a jab here with with value <laughs> investing for him coming on the show and saying, "Oh, what's going on with value right now?" But you know, it is. If you look at the historical data, you know that is true. There have been long periods where value didn't work, which is why it outperforms, you know, in the long run. So uh, you need to stick with that strategy, especially when it's out of favor. Um, so, so let me throw it over to to Wes now that I've started sort of quoting you. Uh, do you have anything in your investment strategy that is a timeless principle that never changes, a religion that never changes? If I can use that phrase. Yeah, sure. I mean, investing, in my opinion, is 100% behavioral game. And so it's really important to find something you believe in and get religious about it at some point because religion helps reinforce discipline, right? Because if you don't follow it, you feel like you, you're going to go to hell or something, right? So it's like this weird mental game where, where you, you, you don't want to ever be too dogmatic about anything, but in the context of investing, it's really important to be dogmatic about something. But then you have the other issue, whereas investing is not just behavioral, it's also math, right? And there's this thing called diversification and not having all your eggs in one basket or philosophy or ethos. Um, because a lot of times people think they're diversified, but they're not. And so to the extent that it's possible, and from a psychology st standpoint, it's incredibly challenging. Like it's very hard to be a Muslim and a Christian devout hardcore simultaneously. But in theory, if one is able to do that in their head, a lot of times you can gain benefits of, of owning, you know, two different religions that, you know, on any individual case by case basis, you know, may not, you're not going to believe in the other one. So, but to the extent you can do that, I think that's important. Um, but to the extent you can't, like if you're a value investor and that's the only thing you can ever believe in, period, um, and anything else is just a bunch of baloney, i.e. your ability to be disciplined at the time that's quote unquote not working, felt falters, it's not worth it. And so for me, going back to your original question, what are timeless principles? Um, it's simple. Fear is a human condition. I think value captures that in the sense that you got to buy stuff that everyone hates. It's ugly. It's nasty. You know, why would you want to do that? So I like value for that reason. But then I'm also a big believer in greed and people are crazy and they're speculative and they're maniacs, right? Well, that's called momentum, you know, <laughs> buy that's working because it continues to keep on working usually and we can all talk about, you know, why that's crazy and it's against the fish and mark hypothesis. But if you've ever met anyone in a sentiment driven market, like right now, to deny momentum is like to deny that you need water and oxygen to live. It's just you're wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm a believer in fear and greed, basically. It's that simple. I like it. Toby, uh, we we talked a week or two ago about the fear and greed index. I uh, can't help but make that uh, comparison. But um, with that being said, um, do you have a timeless principle that, that never changes anything like whenever you have this greed coming in, then you do X or, or anything to that effect? I think Wes gave a really good, I agree with everything that Wes just said that I wouldn't disagree with anything any point that he's made then although the only thing I, I i saw an online poll that said do you need air and water to survive and 97 percent of people said yes so there's like three <laughs> percent of people out there clicking no so i want to meet those people and find out what they're doing i don't know it's uh i, I agree with everything wes says i just i'm constitutionally a value investor so i 
I may need at some stage to put some money into Wes's momentum funds to just to balance myself out, but I'm not I'm not yet at that point. Um, I I, um, I think that things have a value, and I think of myself as like a, a business guy rather than an investor. I'm an entrepreneur more than I'm an, an investor, and I just look at these um, businesses as uh, you know, as businesses rather than as bits of paper that, that, that trade. And I try to buy on the basis of the returns that I'm going to get. And then if the, if the, the position goes against me, then, um, I'm still, I'm still in the mindset of an investor. I look at the, of a, of a business guy, of a, of an entrepreneur, I look at the, um, the performance of the underlying business. And I, I, I have read all of the research on on momentum. I've read Wes's book on momentum. I'm 100% uh, intellectually there with momentum. It's just that last sort of um, emotional step that I can't make, which is why I will probably have to outsource it to Wes at some stage, but not yet. But that's uh, that's sort of. I, I think that behavioural errors are the most are uh, the thing that causes most people to underperform, and most of that is just a lack of conviction in their own in their own strategy. So. You need conviction in what you're doing. You need the religion. You need a code, as I always like to say. But Toby, do you have any kind of threshold for for pain or any kind of of, of data where you're saying I, I need to to step away from value um, as my main strategy? And the reason why I'm asking is that we have a lot of value investors um, following the show, and a lot of them have been through a lot of pain. Uh, you know, with everything that's been going on in the financial markets. And like they hear all these things, they see all these billionaires doing X, Y, C, they hear about whatever. And a lot of them are, you know, they're, they're changing what they do. They're changing how they, how they think about things because it's been, perhaps because it's been too long now um, before you, I, you, you've really seen value perform. So, so how do you, how do you see that? I believe in being rational. I believe in rationality. I'm a Bayesian updater of like the, every, every year that we get some more data that favors some other aspect i try to include that but you've always got the tension of when something looks worst it's often the point that it's about to perform best and vice versa but you need to be bayesian about it too you have to be including the the additional bits of data that come in and and thinking about whether that changes it but i i don't really suffer from fomo i wish everybody the very best in the market i hope everybody does really really well uh, and, and crushes it i'm playing my own game um, which I really enjoy. It keeps me intellectually engaged. It's really fun. Um, and I'm a business value guy at my core. So that'll be the last thing that goes. Jake, timeless principles in your portfolio? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, both of the answers that they gave are, are quite satisfactory. Um, <clears throat> For me, it's very similar, a little bit, probably more sort of Toby, where like I like the brain damage of figuring out businesses and uh, it keeps me engaged with the world and kind of solving puzzles. And, um, you know, I like, I, I never forget that I always own a business and it's always important to me. Like cash flow always matters. And, and then also what is done with that cash flow inside the business, the capital allocation matters tremendously as well. Um, and then, of course, kind of the, the typical margin of safety. Like, I, I just want to get way more than what I feel like I'm paying for. Um, I want to get a deal. Like, I want to feel like I'm getting away with something. And and then probably the last thing would just <clears throat> never lose sight of, like, what is my edge in this? And I'm def I don't have better data sources than anyone. I don't have a better analytical edge. I'm not smarter than anybody. Uh, but I do think I have a good shot at you know, I'm, I'm hiding here in, in Folsom, California, away from a lot of the noise. And I, you know, go on my walks and I listen to, to Warren and Charlie talk and I, I insulate a lot. And, and that gives me, I think, a potential behavioral edge where um, the lower the price goes, the less of a good analyst I need to be. So the more margin of safety I have, the less, the less smart I actually need to be. So I, I try to keep that front and center all the time um, and then just be patient and recognize I'm not going to get all of them. I'm going to pick some things that are wrong, but it's this is a probabilistic game over a long career. Uh, yeah, I think it, I'll do just fine as long as I stick to my my principles and where I think I've got a, a little bit of an edge, and um, and eventually 
uh, it'll it'll work out just fine. So Wes, continue talking about changing, diversifying existing uh, strategies. Um, perhaps we we need that new religion to to stay with that metaphor. Uh, which which type of validation are you looking for before saying this is a I haven't invested like this before. Um, you know, just like you, I remember you coming on here on the show some, some years ago and you're like, I started out as a value investor. I saw all this data validation for momentum. I needed to, I needed to do something about that. Um, which type of, of, of data validation are you looking for before you change your, your mindset? Um, well, for me, it, it basically, I had to write an entire freaking book. Uh, <laughs> to convince myself a few that I needed, diff I needed to maybe compliment another religion. Um, because like, I can't disagree with anything these guys say, because in my DNA, I am fundamentally a value investor. I get it. But then I tried to understand like first principles, like, well, why do I think that value works? Right. Fama told me it's because they got all this extra risk, blah, blah, blah. But then I started thinking, you know what? I like Ben Graham's answer better because it makes more sense based on empirical observation of the marketplace. Mr. Market can get crazy. So, and fundamentals, it makes sense. Like if something makes $10 a year and you know, it's going to keep making $10 a year, you always have that center of gravity and the price will bounce around it. You know, I can exploit that because people are stupid, right? What I came around to believe in is my fundamental belief is people are stupid and lack discipline, period. That's my first principle. And that's why I believe in the value religion is because that was my first principle. Then I started thinking, okay, Wes, if that's your first principle that you think people are crazy and lack discipline, and that's why you believe value works, then fundamentally, why don't you apply that core first principle and see if it espouses itself anywhere else in the marketplace? Oh, there's this thing called momentum and there's this thing called people are maniacs, sentiment driven, FOMO, whatever you want to call it. There's reflexivity in prices, right? Like prices keep moving. Now you got lower cost of capital. You could reinforce, buy cheaper stuff than the other guy. Like, oh my God, my first principle that people are stupid and undisciplined also shows up in another religion called momentum. Right. And then once I got my head around the fact that they're not really different religions, they're just they're just ways to exploit human behavior differently in a disciplined way. Then I was able in my own head. And so in some sense, I really do have one religion. People are stupid and lack discipline. Right. But but one is value. One's called momentum. But in my head, honestly, they're the same thing. People are idiots. And if I have the ability to be to Jake's point. The key edge is discipline. And, and you know, we, we've always, we've talked about like the diet thing, right? I learned this in the Marine Corps, everything in my whole life. Okay. You want to lose weight? Exercise more, eat less, period. It's fundamental, right? It will happen. Why are there 10,000 diets? Why are there 10,000 programs? Why are there 10,000 YouTubers telling you all the 50 million ways to achieve something that's fundamental? Eat less, PT more, have discipline, right? <laughs> Same thing investing. People are idiots. Don't be an idiot. Be disciplined. Think long term. Focus on fundamentals. Great. Let's buy cheap stocks everyone hates and let's buy winners. Who knows when one, one's going to work versus the other. <clears throat> but I fundamentally believe people are stupid on average in the marketplace. It's just that easy. My religion is people are stupid. Let's exploit them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. So, so if you're a value uh, guy, I love whenever you quote scripture, Wes. It's yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I really believe that this is what I've came to the conclusion. I, I, you know, I could change my mind, but that's my new, and this new market is only reiterating <sighs> my faith in my religion that people are stupid and don't have discipline. It's crazy to me, but it is what it is. So, in some ways, I, I don't really, in some ways, ahead. I don't really it doesn't really bother me whether I think that this, I, I was, I was like, where's very much Ben Graham, uh, prefer Ben Graham's explanation, but I think that there's also a large component of it that Famer and French are probably right. There is a big risk component to value as well as some, it's a little bit of both, but 
I'm, t- I'm at the point where I really don't care what the reasons are why something gets cheap. If it's if it's cheap in the sense that I, I can calculate some yield and some some growth component to it, and it looks like it's you know more than the risk that you're taking on, uh, and more than other alternatives, and I think it's a good thing to do. And I that's why I. I don't find it hard to, to be a value guy through these periods of time because I can put these positions on and I can see that there is an expected return in them. And it's, you know, to the point that we've all been making when prices are lower, expected returns do tend to be higher. And I just know that even though it can go against you for a long period of time, and honestly, this one's been a lot longer than, than I would have planned at the start, um, I still think that the underlying theory is sound the logic to it is sound it's just a matter of time and patience in the market and eventually you know like like Wes says giving the example of losing weight like that's i just put it the other way around i think you need to eat less than you than you than you burn and uh if you do it that way it compounds over time it takes three or four years the invest investing is exactly the same you got to get up every morning and do your exercise and you got to be careful with what you eat and you've got to do it for years. But at the end of that, you see a result true in the markets as well. So let's focus on the long term. Uh, Jake, uh, do you see any secular trends for the next decade? And I have to ask if you do, if if that's something you would, you would share with us and how you position yourself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I would say that I have, as I've gotten further into this game, moved further and further away from secular anything, whether it's, you know, interest rate driven, uh, macro, anything GDP related. I think it's all interesting stuff and it, it no doubt matters, but I just don't feel like I could know it. I just, it's too hard to figure out. And there's, it's like any complex adaptive system, the, initial conditions are recognizable that's here's where we are uh where exactly it ends up in the end state is incredibly difficult because there's so many little p- ways that it can go that will create feedback loops that then move you way further afield than you ever would have thought imaginable um so i really i i do less and less of that stuff and i just try to think more and more about these businesses that i own i know they're impacted by all of it i know it's important and it would be awesome to know it but I just I just can't wrap my mind around it enough to feel like I'm actually helping my analysis by trying to untangle some of those rats' nests. So it's less and less a, a part of my my process. Toby, any in the secular trends you're looking at, I'm not necessarily talking about the macro picture, but in general, any consumer behavior that, that are changing that we should be aware of? Well, one consumer behavior is that consumers started consuming value stocks in about September last year, and uh, they started consuming my kind of value stocks in about February this year. I really don't because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm pretty systematic and pretty quantitative about it. So I, I buy good things when they get cheap. Um, I care that they're cheaper than they're good, but I, I tend to lean on the... Um, so, you know, I, I, it's funny though. I, I think I do think it's funny how often value gets in front of macro trends that s- people start talking about subsequently. So I was buying home builders last year. Um, I've had home builders for a little while. And now that's become like a story where we've under, evidently we've underinvested in homes. People are locked in. They're doing looking for houses to buy. Houses have exploded. The home builders are going to do a lot of work. Home building at some stage is going to transition into momentum. But it started out as value and I didn't buy it because I had any insight into the consumers. I just thought it looked like it was at a cyclical low and it looked cheap on that cyclical low. And so I bought it. And I think that often that's what happens with value. If you, I don't really know why it's there. I just know that it is very cheap. And subsequently, the macro picture sort of colors itself in. And I don't know if that's real or if that's just the media picks up on the story, analysts pick up on the story and they add a narrative to it and it's appealing. So I try to I, I try not to do too much sort of um, picking where the consumer is going to go. Just just play the play the field as you find it. And Wes, I know you have a very quantitative approach, so I'm sure it's not like you've been 
I don't know. I shouldn't. I shouldn't be giving you any kind of leading questions uh, <laughs> in the direction of everyone is going to do this, and no one have no one knows about it just yet, except for Wes and the listeners of of the investors. Yeah, part. yeah. So let me just throw it over to you, uh, Wes. Um, any kind of secular trends you're looking at? Um, not really, because because going back to what these guys said, it's so unpredictable, and fundamentally, you know, if you believe fear and greed drive marketplace well that's awesome but how the heck would you predict that like i don't know because i can't predict the future so so i'm very bullish at a high level global macro i think you know technology human capital it's amazing how humans are just incredible creatures to you know invent new solutions to new problems we didn't even know we had the only thing i worry about is you know humans also unwinding the thing like through big government issues you know maybe we blow up the planet in a cloud of smoke with global warming things or whatever <laughs> like wars you know wars suck a lot of people die we for some reason like to start fighting each other every you know 20 years it seems um but outside of like humans being stupid um really stupid i'm actually really bullish just high level on on the world i, I think yeah i think a lot of things are it's going to go up and downs. I can't predict it, but I'm pretty bullish, man. Uh, look forward to life every day. So no complaints in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So um, the last question I have for you here, guys, um, today, at least, well, so far. Uh, so one of the most popular guests we have here on the show, that is uh, Colin Roach. And he often talks about how there is no such thing as passive investing because even passive index funds are still measured against um, a constructed benchmark, which you might say are actively constructed because someone still decided this is what it should be. And you know, each investment strategy also has its own risk profile. We can't all compare to the S&P 500 if we do something completely different. Um, so um, starting with you, uh, Toby, what is your benchmark if any, for your investment strategy, and, and why is that your benchmark? How do you think about that? I have benchmarks that are value that are value benchmarks, but I I think about it a little bit more broadly. I think it should be like S and P five hundred or even the global. I use S and P five hundred right now, but even the global uh, total market would be appropriate if you were if I had some international exposure. I agree with Cullen. It's kind of a funny, you know, S and P five hundred is set by a committee. And they actively decide to include or not include Tesla based on some things. They did the same thing with Google. Um, and then it's it's market capitalization and float adjusted, which float makes a whole lot of sense for people who are trying to run index tracking funds. Float doesn't might not make a whole lot of sense for the average punter out there. Um, so I I I think his point is is fair that even passive indexes aren't really passive. Um, yeah, I, I, uh, <laughs> I don't really think about it too much, honestly, Stig. It's, it's, um, it's just one of those, it's just a feature in the landscape. It's an, there are some arbitrary decisions made about it. It's not particularly, uh, logical or, um, uh, but I wouldn't want to come up with a competing, I wouldn't want to come up with another one. So I think that they're doing okay. Just like whenever Buffett talks about accounting rules, he's like, gap, it's just, so silly, but I don't want to. I don't want to come up with it with like Gap version 2.0. I could um, have a few. I could have a few of the, a few. Of the, I could have a go at a few of the Gap rules and fix some things that I wouldn't run. I wouldn't run uh, investment gains and losses through the PNL. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. You know, I mentioned Colin Rhodes before, and we had him on because he was launching a new ETF, and we talked about how to invest in ETFs. And he mentioned sure. uh, West that he um, he set it up through through Alpha Architect. And so I, yeah. I was just wondering, like, whenever he, because all ETFs uh, have to choose a benchmark, or is it is it you, is it the SEC, or are you choosing one yourself? Like, how does this benchmark thing work whenever you go to an ETF website and you see, oh, it's benchmarked towards that index? Yeah. So, so anytime you have a registered fund, i.e. like a mutual fund or an ETF, in your prospectus, you have to have some benchmark. And I don't know the exact legal guidance, but I know the high level. It's basically what is something that is broad, broad base and appropriate, like with some sort of risk profile, right? So if you do U.S. stocks, 
well, SP 500 is probably in the ballpark, right? And then there's nuance within that. Well, I'm doing value stocks that are only the mid caps in S&P. Mm-hmm. You know, you can get nuance, but technically all you need is a broad base benchmark that roughly approximate the same risk profile that you choose to take in your investment product. And that, that's a mandatory requirement. So. Um, okay. Okay. So, and, and, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, say, so any time you want to learn about a fund and, you know, people think about it less or more depending on who you're dealing with, but you technically have to have it just read their prospectus. It'll have like a, a benchmark outlined in the prospectus. So. No one's reading yeah. prospectuses, Wes. Yeah, yeah. I read them all the time. I hate them. And I, it's my job. So I understand, like, the consumer, it's kind of ridiculous. Like, hey, we're just going to disclose a lot because that's going to make you more informed. Well, sure. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's how it works. Uh, it's more like a lawyer work program. Uh, but we can talk about that later. Uh, so, so. Uh, Jake, uh, whenever we talk about benchmarks, and I know you, you run your own portfolio for the for the clients, and and some might come to you and say, "Well, um, I want to have a well." Most clients typically say something like, "I would like a really high stable return with no downside," uh, <laughs> or so, something yeah, along those no lines. Um, no problem. Okay, I'm just going to do that. But um, how how are you seeing like whenever you, someone's coming to you, whenever you think about it? Is it the S and P five hundred? Is it a fair way to do it? Because I mean, you can select given stocks that perhaps are not best benchmark against that, but still, since they are in the states, should that be your benchmark? Um, how how do you think about that for for your own portfolio, but also for your clients? Yeah, I mean, for I mean, I go so many different places, different sizes of companies, international or U.S. Um, so picking one benchmark and it changes all the time too, depending on where the, where the opportunities are. So um, I do not fit well into any kind of, you know, style boxes. Therefore it's, it's hard to have a, a well-defined benchmark. Um, I would probably choose a, some, cause a lot of times a lot of the money that I manage is like someone's entire net worth. So, you know, if I was just running a fund that was a, a little sleeve of someone's net worth and they were, using me for some specific, uh, you know, style or, or size, then I would say like, okay, I should be compared to that specific benchmark because that's the, really the opportunity cost of that sleeve is what they would have put it in otherwise. But for me, you know, managing entire net worth of a lot of people, I, I think more actually of that, like a, a global, like the MSCI for both equity and bonds in some kind of mixture, sort of just like planet earth return um you know if if you could go anywhere and kind of buy anything and, and you owned everything what would it look like versus that so i think that's probably a little bit more appropriate for my my style um but you know like the the us based investor it could you could make the argument that um uh, hey i don't want you to manage it for me i'm just going to stick it in the s&p 500 and pay no no fees at all and i think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do um so especially over long time periods I don't know how well it'll do over the next five to seven years. Uh, I think just as a base rate bet from today's prices, I, I would be a little pessimistic. I would, as far as uh, that, it won't look like the last 10 years. Um, but in general, I think that um, the other question that is, I think, missing in all this is over what time frame. So we have a benchmark, right? And, you know, over one day, against the s p 500 what do you look like okay well like that is obviously just total random noise uh over one year uh okay well maybe a little bit more information in that but i would still put that not that much different than one day um that's closer to me to one day than it is to actually like 10 years um so it's it's this catch-22 where unfortunately in order to untangle luck versus skill you need a, a pretty large data set of time and maybe even like sort of multiple market environments. Uh, you know, if you're just in a one way market, like we've been in the last call it 12 years, well, I'm not quite sure that you can say full cycle, how good of an investor someone is if they've, you know, like the, the bet has been to be balls to the wall risk. And that has been the way to bet for the last 12 years. But I think we all kind of intuitively know that that, that will come at a cost someday. Um, and that maybe it's not, you know, a foolproof plan. So, uh, 
I think the time horizon is also for this game needs to be measured over much longer periods than probably people are typically comfortable with. And um, uh, it's, it's, it's unfortunate. I don't have a better answer, but um, I do think that, that it benchmarks can lead to short-term thinking that I think actually leads to a sub sub optimization. Uh, I had a look recently at the, um, you know, John Hussman has this method of calculating expected returns over the next decade and he uses the Schiller PE and then he assumes a long run average uh, Schiller PE and he assumes that you mean revert to that over a decade. And um, we can pull up the, the dividend yield of the S&P 500 and then he puts all of these things together and you can track it on a day by day basis. So I have this, I just have this little web scraper that pulls this data and then I chart it. And I just was looking the other day for the the uh, the, the trailing 10-year return on the S&P 500 is like 16%, including dividends, which is like, that's about as good as it gets. And the forward return is now negative on the index, uh, but that includes, it's negative 0.1%, but that includes 1.3% in dividends. So the index will be negative about 1.2% uh, for the next decade on an annual basis, you know, based on assuming that the mean reversion, assuming we go back to the average, assuming it takes a decade, all those sort of things. I will say it's been remarkably predictive, that little chart, as simple as as simple as it is. But I just think there's there's never been, well, there's not never been, but the times when there have been as wide a disconnect between the trailing 10 year and the forward 10 year, you know, they're all notorious kind of dates in that in that chart. It's not a prediction, it's just just an observation. Does that mean revert profit margins or interest rates or anything else that are kind of tipped all in one direction? It doesn't include those things. So, you know, you can come up with a more... So you have more ways to lose. There are more ways that. to lose than, than it looks like on the surface. But I, I already sound crazy enough saying, you yeah. know, negative returns. So that's, that's all I'll say. <laughs> Let those be the final words uh, for this for this episode. Um, Wes, um, Jay, Toby, uh, give everyone a handoff to where they can learn more about you. Uh, Wes, let's start with the, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, alphaarchitect.com or on Twitter at alphaarchitect. All right. Toby? My website is acquirersmultiple.com or acquirersfunds.com. And uh, my Twitter handle is greenback, G-R-E-E-N-B-A-C-K-D, um, where I post four or five times a day. All right. Yay. So this uh, <clears throat> this great resignation, I guess, has been happening in the U.S., where I guess four million people quit their jobs in July. <clears throat> and with that comes a lot of orphan then retirement accounts. And this happens to be something that my firm does a, a lot of is um, people leave a job. They have this account. They're not even paying attention to it anymore. Um, and that's those long-term retirement dollars tend to be a pretty good fit for for a value approach, I think, uh, maybe even more so than a after-tax brokerage. So we, uh, I put together, I had the team put together a little special thing for for the tip audience. Uh, so if you go to orphanira.com backslash TIP, uh, there's a little special in there. Uh, and because I like to talk to every single new investor to make sure that it's a good fit, uh, we only have a kind of a limited amount of bandwidth that we can onboard people in a in a typical month. So there's six spots for for whenever this airs that month that will we have time to be able to bring on board. So let, if you if you want to get in there, I would suggest like don't wait. But so that's that's where uh, if people want to get some help with an orphan retirement account. All right, perfect. It's been handed off. All right, Jens. Um, I look forward to doing this again next next quarter. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Stig. Good seeing everybody. Cheers, everyone. Salud. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on the next podcast episode and new investing resources. What are your takeaways and thoughts on this discussion? Let us know in the comments section below.